Let's begin this morning with the Word of God, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's pray a moment. Our Father... Again, we call on your name and we are grateful for your love and blessing to us today. It's a beautiful day for many reasons. We pray you'll be with us as we consider your word and as we see where it impacts us and where we can live it out. Pray your blessings on each one assembled here. Uh, those who may be watching us uh, by way of stream or or those who are traveling, please be with each one and grant the blessing that they need. We pray uh, we will learn what harvest means according to you. We ask this in Jesus. Amen. Now there was a lifelong city man, tired of the rat race. Decided he was going to give up city life and move to the country and become a chicken farmer. Well, as it, as it turned out, um, he bought a used uh, chicken farm. He, he moved in and actually uh, found out that his next door neighbor was also a chicken farmer. And neighbor came over to visit one day and and said, uh, you know, chick chicken farming isn't easy. I'll tell you what, to help you get started, I'll give you a hundred chickens. Well, the new chicken farmer was thrilled. Two weeks later, the, the neighbor dropped by to see how things were going, and the new farmer said, well, not too well. All 100 chickens died. The neighbor said, I can't believe that. I've never had any trouble with my chickens. I'll give you a hundred more. So he did, and then another two weeks went by, and the, and the neighbor stopped again, and the new farmer said, you're not going to believe this, but the second hundred chickens died also. And the, the neighbor just astounded. He said, I can't believe it. What went wrong? And the new farmer said, well, I'm not sure whether I'm planting them too deep or too close together. Well, I will freely confess to you that I was a city boy, born and raised, didn't grow up in the country, didn't get raised on a farm, never developed a green thumb and Never learned how to plant chickens. So as I have uh, read and studied the scripture, I have had to learn sort of secondhand the background and meaning of a lot of the farming and agricultural images that are often used in scripture. And uh, you, you may be in the same boat with me, or maybe a lot of those things come, come natural to you as you read scripture because you farm. And maybe you'd be a better person to deliver this message this morning. But you know, when I, when I hear about grain and barley, I have to look it up. You know, I have to do a little research about what sowing and planting is and, and what a wine press is when wine presses are mentioned or, and, and, and what in the world a threshing floor is and that kind of thing. I have to do a bit of study to get the picture in my mind. And so even with the word harvest, 
I'm not as much of an expert on that as a, a farmer would be. I don't appreciate it as much. But harvest is a really important word in Scripture. It's an important concept in the Bible. And it's used a lot. That image of harvest. And that makes sense when we think that you know, the Israelites were uh, largely farmers. Most ancient people lived a lot closer to the land than the typical person in our day and age. The Israelites, in fact, had an annual harvest festival. They called it the uh, Feast of Weeks. Sometimes it was called the Feast of Harvest or, or the Feast of First Fruits. And the idea in that festival, that celebration, was to honor God who gave the blessing of their crops that they were now gathering in from the field. It was sort of a Thanksgiving. We're familiar with that. So for them, it was sort of a Thanksgiving time for the harvested crops. Now, from our perspective, their grain fields were, were planted in, in the fall. They grew during the winter, and they were harvested in the spring. Uh, and normally, what they would do after the barley harvest, for instance, was to bring a couple of loaves of bread that were made from the crop, and just lift it up before God and sort of symbolically offer it to him, in effect saying to God, this is really yours, uh, you made it, you blessed it, and we thank you and we praise you for this good stuff that you've given. Well, there was something very simple but very profound about that festival, don't you think? Uh, there was something very faithful about it, just recognizing where good things come from and giving credit where credit is due and saying thank you to God for his blessing. All really good spiritual things. I want you to look at a text with me for a moment from... Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11 there. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. It says there, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. Now notice in this passage from the great old prophet Isaiah, talking again in harvest language. God is speaking through Isaiah here, and he reminds us a very important principle. That is that he is the God of the harvest. Everything needed for a successful harvest comes from him. Without him, there would be no harvest. He gives rain, he gives snow, he waters the earth, he causes the earth to produce, he provides seed and provides bread. All those are very important things that we still depend on uh, for our physical life. But the more important point here in Isaiah 55 is spiritual. With God, see, what is true physically is also true spiritually. So God says... The same thing is true with my word. Notice right in the midst of that text. God says, my word is the same. It comes from me. I send my word into the world and it will produce. It will accomplish my purpose. It will succeed. 
In other words, when it comes to God's word, there will be a harvest. So when we come into the New Testament, then we read about harvest as well. And many times there, it is a spiritual harvest of righteousness in the lives of people. I think of passages like James 3, verse 18. A harvest of righteousness is given in peace by those who make peace. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for, for giving and increase the harvest of your righteousness. See. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. Sometimes it's a harvest of souls that's being discussed. Jesus will say, look, the fields are white unto harvest. He was not talking about a physical thing. He was talking about people. And then Paul tells the Romans in chapter 1, verse 13 of Romans that he wants to reap some harvest among them. Uh, and he's talking there about helping them to grow spiritually in their lives. One of the greatest illustrations of this is... Uh, in Acts chapter 2, where we read to begin. So Acts chapter 2 tells the story of a very special day of harvest. It happened in Jerusalem in about 33 AD. It occurred, appropriately enough, on the day of Pentecost. Because uh, Pentecost is what the New Testament era people called that annual harvest festival that we uh, mentioned earlier. They called it Pentecost in New Testament times. Interesting thing about Pentecost is it always came on the same day of the week. Every year, Pentecost came on Sunday. Uh, the way you figured when Pentecost was, was by counting seven weeks. So as I remember... Every week has seven days, seven times seven, 49. You count seven weeks from the previous festival, which was Passover. Passover always occurred on the Sabbath day, which was Saturday. All right. So seven weeks from Passover. And then the next day, the 50th day from Passover would be Pentecost. Always, always on a Sunday. So on Pentecost Sunday, 33 AD, there was a great harvest. What was the, the fruit of that harvest? The fruit of that harvest was that the church of Jesus Christ was established. It was initiated, begun on that day when 3,000 people plus were baptized into Christ. Uh, another product of that day was that the first time, it was the first time that the full gospel was proclaimed. Uh, Jesus was fully and completely preached for that first time on the day of Pentecost in, in 33 AD. Peter is one who preached the, the message that day and and he, he started with the Old Testament, if you read through Acts chapter 2, and then he continues right on through to talk about the ministry of Jesus, the incredible works of power that he did, his miracles, and then he talks about how he was hung on a cross, and he was killed by lawless men, Peter says. The very Son of God, you see. And Peter talked about how Jesus was buried in that very city where he was speaking, Jerusalem. But that his tomb was empty. And he explains why. Because God raised him up. And that there were all kinds of eyewitnesses even standing at that time that they could talk to that had seen it. 
eyewitnesses to the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And that he goes on, he talks about how Jesus had now ascended to heaven and was exalted at the right hand of God and that he was now sending the Holy Spirit into the world as a, as a gift to people who would receive it. And then Peter very clearly pointed at his audience, pointed at his hearers that day and said in a way that just couldn't be misunderstood, you're the ones, you're the ones who crucified Jesus. You are guilty. And then just, just like God through Isaiah, which we read earlier, just like God said would happen, God's word, when it's sent forth, doesn't come back empty. Because in that crowd, listening to Peter that day, were more than 3,000 people who were cut in their hearts, who were convicted by the accusation that was made, the gospel accusation. They were convinced of who Jesus was. Yes, he was the Son of God, and they were ready to respond to that. And so another fruit of this particular harvest day was 3,000 Christians being born of the water and the Spirit, just like Jesus had said long before would happen. Remember the Lord speaking to a man named Nicodemus? He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. To this crowd, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those who received the word of God that day, who had it planted within them, were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Folks, the word of God has not changed since that time. We preach the same message. We preach Christ. And we preach Christ crucified. And we offer the same hope. We, we talk about an empty tomb in Jerusalem and what that means for the promise of our own resurrection one day. And we look for the same result that God's word, when it finds fertile soil in good and honest human hearts, will not come back void. But it will produce. People will see their need and they will respond. What does that mean? They will believe. They will repent they will be baptized into Christ and they will start their walk with the Lord toward home that is the ultimate meaning of harvest so we we assemble here today on the Lord's day really it's the church's birthday if you think about it a couple of thousand years later this is the day that Jesus came out of the tomb. Sunday. This is the day the gospel was first preached and people first responded to it. It's a momentous day for many reasons. What could it be for you this day? What might you praise God for today? on this 
Lord's Day. What harvest can be had in your life before God even today? Do you need to stand before God today and just say like the ancients used to, thank you. Thank you, God, for all your good gifts. Thank you for your wonderful kindness. Every good gift is from you. I'm sorry for not being thankful. Maybe that's what you need to say today. Maybe you need to stand today and like these people in the crowd on Pentecost Day, 33 A.D., and say, what must I do to be saved? And maybe you need to hear God's word through Peter again. Repent and be baptized. But this time, you need to do it. You need to do it. It's harvest time. And if you need to come at harvest time, won't you come while we stand, while we sing this song?